I've been adding a bunch of features to improve the world generation on my C++ Minecraft clone, but I think it's finally time to add some gameplay. So today, I'm giving the player the ability to build and break blocks. This led to me remaking my planet and chunk system to optimize generation, so look forward to that. As usual, most of this is streamed live on Twitch and YouTube. Subscribe here or follow me on Twitch so that you don't miss out on future streams. The first thing I need to do is create a ray casting system. My ray casting system is pretty simple. You provide a starting point and a direction vector. The ray cast function has a distance variable that it keeps track of. Every step, the distance variable gets added by the specified step amount. Then a result position is determined by multiplying the direction vector by the distance variable and then adding it to the starting position. It then checks to see what the block is in that position. If it's any block besides an air block, it returns information about the block that it hits. If it reaches a max distance before hitting anything, it returns saying that it didn't hit anything. Here's the code I initially came up with for the raycast. There are some major problems with the math in this function, as some of you might be able to see. To break a block, we simply send a raycast and tell the chunk to set the block that we hit to an air block. The chunk then recreates its mass. I run into many issues while making this though. So mouse click, physics, raycast, camera dot position, camera dot front, max distance of five. Okay, so then this is gonna just return chunk, local, local. Why are you guys talking in different languages? Can you talk in English, please? <laughs> I don't know what you guys are saying. <laughs> Result dot chunk dot, oh crap. Uh... We have to do reload chunk. Why are these vectors? Why did I do it this way? <laughs> I'm going to leave it just like this, just to screw with people's heads. Yeah, so this is going to do this, and then it's going to call generate chunk mesh. Is this going to crash the moment I try to run this? Because I've been sitting here messing with... Oh, <laughs> okay. Chunk data index is equal to new block. And we need to do generate chunk mesh. Update block. Um, Does this work? Evidently not. Remember to take care of Fingy. I kind of forgot that we have a child. Oh, you know what? I know why. Because I normalize start pause. I'm not supposed to normalize start pause. I'm supposed to normalize direction. Direction's already normalized. I don't need to do this. What am I doing? All right, it still doesn't function. Wait, this needs to be plus direction. Oh, oh, I know what's happening. I know what's happening. All of these things, right? We need to actually clear these guys. That's our problem is that we're not clearing these things out. So it's just doing the same thing. Why is that spelled wrong? <laughs> there we go. Look, nothing is correct, but it is somewhat functioning. What is happening? Wait, why am I dividing this by 16? The chunk size is 32, not 16. Is that why I'm getting errors? Is that why it's not working? Oh, that is why it wasn't working, guys. Look. Oh, we can destroy water too. Oh, and it does not work. Why are you doing Why are you like this? Stop being like this. So stop being like this to his own code. The stream kind of went off the rails at a certain point and I don't really remember much of it, but I started streaming the next day to finish what I started. The first issue I decided to tackle was breaking not working in negative chunks. This is because of rounding. When I'm in positive chunks, I can simply divide by the chunk size and remove the decimal. However, in negative chunks, I need to round up to the next chunk in the negative direction. Here's the code to fix this math. With that, breaking blocks is now fully functional, so it's time to add building. This is more difficult because we have to determine which face to build on after we hit a block. To do this, I get the distance between the hit position from the raycast and the center of the block it hit for each axis. I pick the axis with the highest distance and place a face in the negative or positive face on that axis depending on which side of the block was hit. That's the theory, now let's implement it. <laughs> why? Wait, why am I able to do this? I can right click to break the blocks as well. I don't remember adding that. <laughs> I did add that. Wait, why do we have, <laughs> what is this? I have two of these. And this one doesn't even make sense. I don't know why we have just actual chunk. Like, what is this? And then we have an if statement here. So I don't know what this is, but we're just going to remove that. I don't think that should cause any issues. But we can set it to like one and then it'll place dirt. <laughs> we got a little dementia. Hey, I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> so now we can replace every block with dirt, including the water, which is interesting. Well, we need the distance from the center, I guess. If dist x is less than zero, this and else we do this. We can get rid of that now. Okay. So if it's less than zero, we need to do it. In the negative direction yeah i did this the other the wrong way around yeah okay so now it's gonna actually do it on the right faces right if dist wait absolute value of dist x is greater than the absolute value of dist y this is gonna be a mess but i'll clean it up then then we need to also check if the absolute value of dist x is greater than the absolute value of dist z my brain is so dead i need more coffee it does it functions look at that i can add the blocks <laughs> That's funny, it loops around like that. Inner chunk block placing is annoying because the raycast returns a chunk and local block position for the wrong chunk. So we basically have to ignore half of the information given and get it all over again. Oh. <laughs> I need to do else if local block X is greater than or equal to planet chunk size. But we need to do plus one. 
this needs to be set to zero then. Okay, so now this should work on the X axis, only on the X axis right now. We can go from there. Uh, well, <laughs> all right, well, everything's broken. Oh, okay, it's, it's more like issues with it being in the negatives. That's why, that's why it's not working. Uh, why, why you no work? Oh, cause I've been placing blocks in the wrong direction this entire time. I didn't do the Z direction yet. I may, I was doing all these changes in the X direction or, and then I was trying to place blocks in the Z direction. So now we ought to do the same thing for all the other axes, which is fun. All right, so this doesn't work. Oh wait, yeah, we're in negative chunk territory now. We gotta stay positive or else it breaks. Cause I'm bad at programming, don't know what I'm doing. Block X is equal to result pause dot X is greater than equal to zero. Result pause dot X. And then if it is less than zero, result pause dot X minus one. Y, Z, Y, Z. I think that probably does it. It does work now in the negative access. That's, that's good stuff. Building works now. Let's look at the final code. Here's the raycasting code. I'm sure there's probably a better way to handle positive and negative chunks, but this works just fine. Here's the code for breaking blocks. It's very simple. You've seen this before, but here's the building code once again. Next, I decided to add a pick block feature so that you can build more than just dirt. The code for this is simple. I just do a raycast when the user clicks their scroll wheel and get the block at that position. I had some issues with the display in I'm GUI though. Translate the selected block in into what block you have selected. Array of int, too few arguments. Yeah, 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 nobody cares. 15, expecting an identifier. Block names, air, dirt. You've gotta be kidding me. You know what, tell you what. <laughs> Why did I do, sorry, I don't know. I don't know what I'm doing. That was, they're quite possibly the stupidest code I've ever written in my life. Block name. Why don't I just do that? All right, there we go. So now we have the names. This is so, hold on. <laughs> let me fix, let me fix the comments real quick. Uh, so if we do blocks, blocks, selected block dot block name. There we go. Okay, there we go. That works. So we can now see the name of the block. This one doesn't work though. It doesn't work with these. I don't know why. Why does it not work with the bottom, with the tall grass bottom? Is it too long? Surely not. Yeah, it is because of the length. The length of it is too long, so it doesn't work. Well, I guess we'll just call it low, tall grass bot. Despite the name length issue, everything is working. Now you can grab blocks with the middle mouse button, left click to break blocks, and right click to place blocks. The next thing I want to do is add some quality of life features to make it easier to tell where you are breaking and placing blocks at. I decided to start by trying to draw a block outline on the block you're looking at. I first tried drawing the world in wireframe mode. GL polygon mode. GL front and back GL line. So this, oh my, I don't know about this one. Yeah, so this literally just makes it a line. Oh, I know why it's not working, guys. And do GL fill here. There we go. Now it's wired. No, wired, yeah, now it's wire rendering. So the problem was that not only was I turning on line mode for the actual like vertices and everything, but I was also turning on wire mode for the post-processing. The post-processing literally, it literally just renders a rectangle on the screen. So it was just rendering the, the lines of the rectangle. After I got that working, I spent an entire hour trying to draw a square on the screen. You'd think I'd be good at this by now, but apparently not. But finally I got it. We got a square guys, we got a square. There's a square on my screen. <laughs> <laughs> now that we have a square, we can make a cube. I did this by creating vertices and a series of lines to make up the outline of a cube. The line is slightly bigger than a full block to avoid Z fighting. Then when rendering the block outline, we switch the polygon mode to GL line. With the cube done, we can set the position of the cube to the block that the player is looking at. This is the final product. It's subtle, but it helps a lot to show the player what block they're looking at. I'm going to have a short bonus video out next week to show some more shader nonsense that Chai and I came up with when deciding on a color for the outline. The next thing I want to do is add a crosshair. This is done by creating vertices for the crosshair that center it on the screen when using an orthographic viewport. Next, I load a crosshair texture and create an orthographic matrix. After rendering all non-UI stuff, I render the crosshair. GL enabled GL color logic opline changes the rendering to render the inverted color of whatever was on the screen before. This way, instead of using a solid color, I can use the inverted color like how Minecraft does it. Here's the final result. With these quality of life additions, building is much easier. As you can see, my current world generation is very slow. I decided to remake my world and chunk system to fix this. With the old system, there was a weird mix of roles between planet and chunk. Every frame, the planet would fill the chunk queue with the player move to a different chunk, create a chunk for the front of the queue, and render all chunks. The chunk class when created would create a new chunk generation thread. The chunk generation thread would generate the chunk data of that chunk and the chunk data of all six rounding chunks regardless of whether or not they already existed. It would then generate the chunk mesh. With the new system, the planet only needs to render every frame, and the chunk thread handles the chunk queue, the chunk creation and chunk data generation, and the chunk mesh generation. The chunk thread also keeps track of all chunk data currently generated and only generates new chunk 
data if necessary. It also clears any unused chunk data. This is a bit simplified, but we're essentially making one thread that handles just about everything having to do with chunks. Here's a speed comparison of the new and old system. The left is the old system and the right is the new system. Both of these have a render distance of 10 and a render height of 3. There is so much code that went into this that it would take a long time to show it all and I already explained how the new system generally works, so I won't show it here. However, the GitHub repository is in the description so you can check it out for yourself. It's still pretty inefficient but it's a huge improvement. Before I was using a vector to store chunk data. I changed this to an array which should make it more efficient. I'm also using uint16t instead of a 32-bit unsigned int which saves a lot of memory as well. Now it's time for random bug fixes. There was a bug where resizing the window would mess up the FOV and not change the actual resolution of the game. This is because I wasn't updating the resolution of the frame buffer when the resolution of the game changed so the game would render as 1920 by 1080 regardless of the actual window size. This was fixed by saving the frame buffer texture and the depth buffer texture and then updating the resolutions whenever the window size changed. Trunk size is a const expression variable that you can just change but doing so previously would just cause it to crash. This is partly because I'm hard coding 32 into the world gen a bunch of times. I'm also passing chunk size into world gen instead of just using it from planet. I'm moving the hard coded values and the chunk size parameter fix the crashing but now surface features are gone. This is because many calculations using chunk size for features required signed math but chunk size is unsigned which leads to weird conversions and incorrect math. I fixed this by simply declaring a static int at the top of the function that sets its own int version of chunk size to the unsigned chunk size. As far as I'm aware since this is static it'll only do this conversion once and not every time it's called. Features work on all chunk sizes now. This wasn't a necessary change because I'm planning on leaving it at 32 but people kept talking about it in the discord server and I wanted to try to fix it. Now you can have a chunk size of 16 or 64. You can even have a chunk size of 1. This was definitely a necessary addition. Somebody called the vertical camera movement incorrect because it's based on the camera's up direction instead of the global up direction. I did this intentionally but I figured I'd added the global up option as well. This is as simple as using a vec3 with y set to 1 instead of the camera's up variable. This movement works now. However, I decided to make it a setting. In fact, I decided to add a bunch of options to IMGUI. I added options to change the render distance, enable and disable vsync, and of course toggle absolute y for camera movement. I also removed the decimals from FPS, making it much cleaner. Many of these bugs were found and fixed by contributors to the repository, so thank you to everyone who helped out. I'm pretty happy with the performance improvements and quality of life changes, and of course building is done, which is quite cool. That's all I have for this episode though. My next episode will be about UI, so subscribe so you don't miss that. Thank you to my Patreon supporters, Dennis Fetchner, Mark H, Flex HD, and Foralimus. Thank you to my YouTube members, Shy Guy Mario number 1066 official, Mudkip Dev, New Day Dirt 23, and Jess 1T. If you'd like to support me and gain early access to videos and project code, you can do so in either of those places. As usual, the GitHub repository for the project is in the description as well as links to my Twitch, Discord server, and Patreon. Thank you all so much for watching and I'll see you all next time. Goodbye.